Um, but uh, I think that's doable. Welcome to everyone else who's just came, uh, who just come in um, in the past one minute. A lot of people are joining today, as they should, to be honest. We have a really, really good conversation today. Um, and I would, I would say we officially start our panel. Um, well, welcome to the third episode of our online discussion series on reframing reproduction. Um, and today is about reframing abortion. So welcome everyone. Um, what a perfect time to talk about abortion, right? Um, we've all read the news by now. We know that the United States Supreme Court is at the moment currently discussing whether or not to overturn Roe versus Wade, the landmark decision that basically established a woman's legal right to abortion in the US. And uh, the final decision is expected in a few months, but I think I speak for everyone on the panel today when I, see, when I say that it is truly a stark reminder that reproductive rights are not set in stone, that the example of Roe versus Wade is also a display of how easily any, any abortion legislation um, can be taken away from us. Um, the anti-choice movement is on the rise everywhere and it is globally connected, um, being behind restrictive laws um, like those in Poland and Texas. Um, however, we also see really good examples um, successful feminist or um, campaigns for the legislation um, of uh, abortion in Colombia or Argentina. So this is why today, during the course of this panel, um, we will be looking at how abortion legislation can look like in different countries, um, such as Colombia and Poland. Um, but we will also look beyond national borders um, and dive deeper in best practices and learn from each other as feminist uh, movements and scholars so that we can perhaps one day um, achieve legal abortions everywhere. Um, and I think our panelists today are the absolutely right experts to talk to about this. I really can't wait. Um, but first, there are some housekeeping things that I would like to point out before um, we begin. This conversation is live uh, streamed and is currently being recorded. Um, we also have one of our panelists is joining us from Colombia today, and she will be speaking in Spanish. So if you are not, um, well, as <laughs> my Spanish skills are very, very little. <laughs> so if you also uh, have the same amount of Spanish skills, you can check um, uh, down, in, down below uh, for the trans to the different translation options and just switch to the English one. So um, you can get it in English or whatever other language um, we, we offer there. Also, feel free to ask questions in the chat throughout the conversation. Um, we do have a time for our conversation together, but we have also dedicated time for a Q&A at the end, um, meaning we will talk for about an hour and open the floor up for questions and feedback. Um, also, if you are on Twitter or on social media, you can uh, tweet or share the event um, and share your thoughts on the topic that we discuss. Uh, you can use our hashtags um, to connect with others um, who are also sharing um, their ideas and perspectives. Um, you can see the hashtags um, in the chat below. And um, what else? What else do I want to say? I also want to say many thanks to the organizing team. Um, I am not one of it. I am here to basically facilitate the conversation today. But uh, many thanks to the organizing team, to Naida, Jana, Adna, and Tedia, of course. Um, but now to our panelists. Um, welcome, everybody. Welcome, Carolina, Sandra, and Adriana. I'm so excited. I uh, would like to start with your respective bios, if uh, it's okay. Karolina Vyachkiewicz, uh, welcome to today's panel. Um, Karolina, you are a legal activist and focused on abortion and sexual health issues. 
Um, in 2016, you co-founded Abortion Dream Team. It's an informal group of activists and lawyers who travel around Poland to, expl to explain medical abortion and promote speaking about abortion without stigmatization. Um, Karolina is also a member of INROADS, that's short for International Network for Reduction of Abortion Discrimination and Stigma, and also a member of the legal group at the Transfusion Foundation, helping transgender people. If her day is not over, <laughs> Karolina is also a consultant at Amnesty International Poland and cooperates with many other NGOs, coalitions, networks, informal groups about advancing sexual and reproductive rights in Poland and in Croatia. Welcome to the panel, Karolina. Adriana Lamaczkova, um, you are next. <laughs> you lead the Center for Reproductive Rights Legal Advocacy Group in, um, in Central and Eastern Europe. The center is um, a global human rights organization that works to ensure reproductive rights are protected in law as fundamental human rights. Adriana has been doing this for the past 20 years. Before joining the center in 2010, Adriana worked with Freedom of Choice in Slovakia, the European Roma Rights Center, and as a legal advisor at the office of the Slovak government. Welcome to you as well. And our last panelist, last but not least panelist, Sandra Maso. Um, Sandra is joining us today from Colombia. It's quite early in the morning there, I heard. Um, so buenos dias to you, Sandra, and bienvenido. <laughs> Just a quick heads up. Um, as I said, she will be talking in Spanish and for our translators to really fully, um, you know, put, give, make her point come across, I will be speaking a little bit slowlier. And this is also a little bit of a reminder to every panelist um, here today to speak, to take your time while you try to make your point. We are not running out of time. We have one and a half hours together and um, the translators will be so thankful for us to to take our time. Um, Sandra um, is the director of Católicas por el Derecho a Decidir in Colombia. I hope I have said that right. A feminist organization that is part of the Causa Justa movement for the elimination of the crime of abortion from the Colombian Penal Code. And Sandra will have so many things, good things to talk to about us. Welcome, and I would say, uh, let's begin our conversation. Let's dive right in. Um, Adriana, I would love to start with you because at the Center of Reproductive Rights, you take a look at abortion laws worldwide. You have an overview of what's going on, where. And um, could you give us a little bit of a quick overview of abortion laws globally? And what are some trends that you've observed? Where is where, where is the pro-choice movement heading towards? Thank you, Sam, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to the panel discussion today. Uh, thank you, Heinrich Wolf Stiftung, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, today, uh, also with uh, Sandra and Carolina. Um, I'll try to answer your question um, in a nutshell. Uh, to say that um, the majority of the countries globally currently allow um, or have laws that allow abortion in a certain um, circumstances, for example, where uh, health or life of the woman uh, is at risk or in uh, cases uh, where pregnancy resulted uh, from sexual assault. Um, very few countries currently um, impose total bans on abortion. Um, and in fact, um, uh, most countries allow abortion on request or have laws that allow abortion on request um, or in broad uh, social, socioeconomic circumstances. Over the past, um, uh, years, we have seen 
um, increasing number of countries across the world uh, that have adopted um, um, law and policy reforms that seek to ensure broader access uh, to abortion care and, and um, with the purpose of creating the enabling environment for people to be able to access this essential medical care service. Um, just to mention few in the past, uh, very uh, in very recently, we have seen countries like um, France, Iceland, Thailand, Colombia, obviously, and Sandra will talk about it more, Argentina, um, and um, in other countries across the world that have uh, uh, sought to um, adopt legislation and policies uh, to uh, to enable access to, to abortion care. In some countries, this has been incremental reforms, um, introducing, for example, going from total bans, introducing abortion in uh, certain, only in certain narrow, narrowly defined circumstances. In other countries, um, uh, legislatures adopted laws that permit abortion on request or broad social grounds um, up to um, certain uh, time limit. Um, um, of, uh, of pregnancy. Um, so in, uh, in Europe, um, I, I work, uh, as you mentioned, I work uh, um, um, in uh, the Centrist Europe program. And so our focus is on uh, laws and policies in Europe. And speaking uh, of uh, uh, situation in Europe, there, there are very uh, few countries that do not allow abortion on request or broad social grounds. Um, in uh, some of these countries, reforms are underway uh, that uh, seek to um, broader access uh, uh, to care. Um, Poland is uh, the only country in Europe that in recent history has removed legal ground on abortion. And Carolina will talk about it uh, more. And, uh, and so most of the countries do allow abortion on request or on broader social grounds. This is not to say that the situation in these countries is perfect and uh, access to abortion care is ensured. And, um, and there are um, um, barriers either in directly in the law or policies or in practice that uh, make access um, difficult uh, for uh, for many people. I think I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Um, oh yeah, your camera is working again. I was about to say you were frozen on my end, but now it is um, working again. Adriana, one follow up question: um, What is the general trend like? Is it, could you could you say if there if there is a more of a backlash or are we going towards more promotion of um, abor um, abortion laws. Um, do you can you say a little bit, just very roughly, generally, where is the trend kind of going towards? If you can say anything about that, I believe if you look at uh, just the recent history, Latin America, Colombia, Argentina, also with a few countries in in Africa and uh, and a number of countries in in uh, in Europe uh, that we have seen. Um, global trend towards uh, ensuring broader access to abortion care. Um, at the same time, we have also seen concerted efforts by anti-SRHR actors, actors that are advocating to restrict access to sexual and reproductive health care services, um, who seek to restrict abortion laws and policies. And we have seen countries um, across the world considering legislation that uh, seek to impose further barriers uh, on access to abortion. Thank you so much. Let's stay in Europe for a while. Um, Carolina, um, I mean, as just Adriana kind of mentioned, you have some parts of Europe, for example, like Northern Ireland or France um, that have recently liberalized abortion laws. Um, you also have Malta with the lows, with the worst law in Europe, I would say, or maybe you can say if, if Poland is even worse. But um, the Constitutional Court in Poland 
um, pretty much closed the door to legal abortion as well. They had a ruling in 2020 and thousands of people protested against it. I remember the images very well. And you created Abortion Dream Team along with three other women in 2016, however, to, well, not just to fight that because you were there before, but um, basically to be there to, to, to promote um, abortion and reproductive rights. How has the situation been um, since the ruling uh, in 2020? How, how has it affected your work at Abortion Dream Team? Yeah, first of all, thank you uh, very much for uh, inviting me and having me here. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to, to take part in this discussion. And also to make the long story short, um, we haven't had um, access to abortion that is provided by the state and that is um, taken responsibility for by the state since 1993, basically. So what happened, because we don't have a, such a thing as abortion on demand that is provided by the state on any in any way. Uh, is it allowed? Yes, it is. You can have your own abortion, uh, but there is absolutely no way in which the state will help you with that. So the only circumstances in which you can count on anything from public health care system uh, used to be just three cases. So when pregnancy is a result of a criminal act, when there is a threat to a pregnant person's health or life, and when there is, uh, there is this embryopathological diagnosis of, of a fetus. And that was put an end to in 2020 by the Constitutional Court. And what happened is basically what we knew would happen. <laughs> People who used to have a uh, a right to fight for an abortion in a Polish hospital had to turn to someone else to help them have these abortions. And we are speaking about people who, in most cases, had to go abroad from Poland to have a surgical abortion in the country that would allow for that. Mm -hmm. Because it, in many cases, the embryopathological diagnosis is given you know, with a certain uh, amount of certainty that people look for in this process uh, later in pregnancies, which means that sometimes even closer to the end of the second trimester, which means that it's usually not convenient for people to take pills at home. So they want to travel. And the most a uh, relevant group that we are a part of in this case is abortion without borders that we established a year before. And because of the fact that the pandemic hit right away, we were used to working in difficult circumstances. So when the ruling came, we basically knew, okay, it's gonna be three people with embryopathological diagnosis that want to travel a day and that's exactly what happened. Mm. So what happened really is not that those people do not have access to abortion because they do, but the whole burden and the whole responsibility, including financial responsibility for that is on the shoulders of the informal network that we are a part of because the state does not take any responsibility for that. They crossed it out from the law and they said, do whatever you want, we don't care, we're not gonna help you, just like it has been done with anyone basically who wanted an abortion because if we are pregnant and we don't wanna be, we still have to do it on our own. It is legal for us to do it. We can order pills, we can go abroad, but uh, we either pay it for ourselves or other people pay for that, you know, give, by giving donations and, and buying. Uh, each other abortions. So, yeah, so people were just, you know, moved away, yeah, I would say, like moved outside the system. It's like, there's nothing you can look for here. Of course, there are different strategies to try to use what's left of the law 
you know, try to do it on the ground of the threat for health or life of a person who's pregnant, you know, and there are people who are trying to do that. Uh, luckily, we have enough money in Abortion Without Borders to provide help to anyone who need that, who needs that help and who falls within the scopes of legal abortion in the countries, in, in European countries, because sometimes it's also you know, too late because there are different shapes of these abortions. So that's basically what, what changed in our work. We just have more people who really have to travel abroad and that costs money, time and, you know, effort of, and it, whole responsibilities basically outside Poland for mm -hmm. that. And not everybody can travel. Um, not everybody can access that, um, those legal ways to get an abortion. Um, so if I understood you correctly, you're saying that, you know, women or pregnant people can order abortion pills themselves, but it would be illegal for you um, to assist them with getting uh, abortion pills, right? Well, it depends who you ask, what kind of, what, what part of me you are asking. If you are asking this rebel lawyer that I am, that wants to push the boundaries, I would say nothing connected with pills is illegal in Poland. Because when we take into consideration that the criminal code and the regulations that, um, you know, criminalize aiding and abetting in abortion are from back in, they were adopted back in 1996 as a follow-up to the act on family planning that was banning abortion uh, that was established in 1993. It had absolutely nothing to do with pills. It, you know, the way it's constructed, it's, you know, if you perform an abortion on someone and then paragraph two, if you assist, you know, so it's it's a combination of a person who illegally performs abortion, meaning, you know, in most cases, a doctor in the gray zone, and a person who is helping, in fact, that doctor to commit that crime is a person who is criminalized. Mm -hmm. But the actual definition, the actual um, way it's been going is that everything connected with helping someone get an abortion is considered within the scope of that article. I am totally against that. And I think that's not right, also from the legal point of view. Uh, but we've had cases in which people have been convicted and sentenced for providing pills to their close ones. Mm -hmm. you know, a husband, a, a, a mother, and of course, it is, it is very few people, if we take into consideration how many of us, you know, help each other every day. But if there is this unfriendly third party that will report that to the police, it can be a case of that. So it is a risky behavior to provide someone with actual pills, mm. but not when we are assisting someone, giving information, being with someone who takes pills, taking them to the hospital, but providing pills is considered a crime in Poland, sadly. Mm. I mean, that there was um, a case at the moment, there is a case at the moment that's very, that's gotten a lot of attention. Uh, last one, last month, one of the women behind Abortion Dream Team, one of your colleagues, basically, um, and I hope I'm, uh, I say her name correctly, Justina Vidrijinska, uh -huh. um, was arrested by the authorities. Um, Justina is a 47-year-old um, mother of three, and she has been charged with assisting in an abortion and currently faces up to three years in prison. Uh, the trial will be held in two months, I believe. Mm -hmm. Is this the first time this has happened where someone has been, um, well, basically where someone is ch facing charges? Um, and is also, would you say that this is a political case? Like why there is so much attention on this case? Mm -hmm. So the first thing is that um, it is not the first case. As I said, uh, there have been cases in which uh, people were charged with that. Uh, 
uh, but the close ones, you know, so there was the mother with the daughter and, you know, they happened to reveal that information to someone who uh, thought they had to report that. But, but this, this is the first, is the time, first activist. time, yes, an okay. activist, someone who is not connected to the person they assisted in any way. It's just, you know, they're total strangers. Of course, you know, we call ourselves abortion friends. So, and it's, you know, the intimacy between a person who needs help and a person who helps them is, is very strong. But in terms of, you know, relationship before that, they were strangers. And, um, and yes, this is the first case uh, also in Europe uh, in which an, uh, an activist is charged with uh, aiding and abetting for supporting someone uh, to have an abortion. And it is a very, uh, you know, it's, it has many sides. One of them is a personal side that Justin is also openly talking about uh, when she explains that she has done it and she would have you know, would, would do it again, because that was a story that just really, you know, moved her heart because she knew how it was for herself also to be in a very similar situation. So she had no doubt and no hesitation. And it was just an unfriendly third party uh, on the side of, uh, of, um, of the person who needed help, which is also a sad part of the story who, who didn't want that and who just decided uh, to, to, you know, to control that situation and to report that to the police. Uh, in, and, you know, it only happened, it's not that, you know, people are looking what we are doing and what we are sending and to whom, but this case, you know, has this political dimension as well, because, uh, you know, and there are, different, uh, there are different circumstances that prove that. First of all is the fact that it, the, the trial started in April. Actually, it was the first uh, first uh, time that it, it 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 went to court, and it was a very fast uh, decision because uh, the accusation act was ready in December, and in Warsaw, to have the first court uh, sitting in four months after the, the 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 you know the act is filed in, it's just really. Um, and not that um, common, I would say. Mm -hmm. And we know that it happened also because of some MPs intervention. You know, they want like they ask the prosecutor's mm -hmm. office, like, what is going on? Why don't you go after them? And, you know, mm -hmm. so it is in a very symbolic way. It is, uh, of course, a political uh, case and, you know, not also alone, but we have to take into consideration that there are many proceedings that are going on. You know, some of them are just really about nothing, but people do report uh, different things to the police. They are in a way um, that I talk, they, you know, they, they are encouraged, I would say, to do that by uh, anti-choicers, anti-choice organizations. So, you know, so we are in a way harassed by the police because we have to, you know, go and testify about different cases uh, over and over again. But here we have the case in which there is a real uh, threat. Uh, you know, it's like legally for me that, you know, it's impossible to happen, but because we have that political dimension and we have certain atmosphere around abortion and the fact that there are many people on the side of anti-choicers, anti-abortion movements that are so mad at us for what we are doing and the way mm -hmm. we are doing, meaning mm -hmm. openly and proudly, <laughs> that, you know, that it can be, uh, it, it has this dimension that can, you know, lead that case in, in, in different directions. So the next uh, sitting of the court is in fact in uh, mid-July. Um, Sandra, um, there's a totally different development taking place in um, Latin America, specifically in Colombia. Um, and you are today, as I said, joining us from Colombia. Um, for those that perhaps didn't quite uh, get the news, on February 21 of this year, um, Colombia's constitutional court voted something entirely different than in Poland. They voted that pregnant people could be, finally terminate their pregnancies until the 24th week. It's a tr truly a milestone for reproductive rights of all people. 
Um, just a few months ago, abortion in Colombia before February was still considered a crime with extremely narrow exceptions. Um, pregnant people were only able to get abortions if the pregnancy posed a risk to the health or their lives or in cases of rape um, and incest. Otherwise, you could get punished and would be thrown to jail up to four and a half years in prison. Um, you could spend there. Um, and once the ruling was done, um, the first newly legal abortion took place just two days after the decision in February. And this is all thanks to Casa Justa and also, of course, thanks to Sandra. Um, Sandra, uh, what do you think? What has led to the success of Casa Justa? Bueno, pues en primer lugar, bueno, muchas gracias por hacernos esta invitación a, a Causa Justa y a las organizaciones que hemos hecho posible este sueño, que es un sueño de muchas mujeres en Colombia. Eh, como pueden ver, América Latina tiene nuevos vientos, hay una marea verde que está subiendo y subiendo, el verde ha sido el símbolo que desde las compañeras de Argentina empezaron a irradiar en toda América Latina y en el mundo y, y, y estos nuevos vientos que recorren América Latina al fin llegaron también a Colombia, un país eh, que ha pasado y sigue pasando por una violencia estructural y múltiples discriminaciones. Pero hoy no vine a hablarles de, 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 de esta eh, dolorosa situación que vivimos en Colombia, sino lo que ha significado para nosotras como movimiento de mujeres lograr desde la lucha, la resistencia, eh, un propósito de muchísimos años. Eh, en Colombia el aborto hace 20 años, hace 16 años, eh, cuando escuchaba a Carolina eh, era como escuchar la situación de Colombia hace 20 años, hace, hace más de 16 años. En Colombia el aborto era penalizado, eh, se abrió una puerta muy importante, esto ha sido un paso eh, muy importante, en 2006 se despenalizó en tres causales el aborto, cuando estaba en riesgo la vida y la salud de las mujeres, eh, por malformación fetal incompatible eh, y por violación. Tuvimos 16 años con esta sentencia de, de estas tres causales, que sin duda mantuvieron el problema, o sea, abrieron, esto abrió un camino muy importante para nosotras, las mujeres en Colombia, pero las barreras de acceso continuaban. Entonces, nosotras, las organizaciones, especialmente de derechos sexuales y reproductivos, al acompañar a tantas mujeres y al denunciar tantas barreras, nos dimos cuenta que ya era hora, o sea, en el 2020, decidimos juntarnos eh, alrededor de una iniciativa que nació en el 2017, una iniciativa que se llama Causa Justa, que nos convocó, nos convocó a unirnos, a pensar, dar un paso adelante frente a estas tres causales, que no nos podíamos quedar toda la vida con tres causales y que estaban generando tantas barreras. Entonces, en el, do, en el 2020 decidimos... Eh, cinco organizaciones que pertenecíamos al movimiento Causa Justa elaborar una demanda a la Corte Constitucional para eliminar el delito de aborto del Código Penal. O sea, lo que consideramos que era un problema en Colombia era mantener el delito. Y en ese sentido, cinco organizaciones, estas son la Mesa por la Vida y la Salud de las Mujeres, el Centro de Derechos Reproductivos, Women's League Worldwide, el Grupo Médico por el Derecho a Decidir y Católicas por el Derecho a Decidir, nos juntamos, elaboramos una demanda a la Corte Constitucional, una demanda que duró más de 500 días en la Corte Constitucional con todas las barreras jurídicas para que se pudiera discutir y como dices tú, el 21 de, de febrero eh, al fin la Corte Constitucional eh, pidió un fallo en el que se despenaliza el aborto o se elimina el delito de aborto hasta la semana 24. 
Causa Justa fue, es un movimiento que fue creciendo, es un movimiento que agrupa más de 100 organizaciones de derechos sexuales y reproductivos, academia, personas comprometidas con los derechos sexuales y reproductivos, y lo que generó este fallo indudablemente fueron varias estrategias. Una, la de la incidencia política que hicimos en diferentes instancias. La segunda estrategia que fue muy importante fue documentar, hacer mucha investigación y demostrar que mantener el delito de aborto en Colombia era ineficaz, discriminaba a las mujeres y sobre todo era injusto. O sea, mantener el delito no hacía que las mujeres dejaran de abortar y que solu la solución no era vía penalizando a las mujeres, sino generando unas políticas sanitarias que regularan el aborto en el ámbito de la salud. Entonces esto fue muy importante como estrategia, la documentación y la investigación. También fue muy importante este logro y creo que de, las, de los grandes logros de Causa Justa es que situamos la conversación en lo público, es decir, que el debate lo pusimos nosotras. Nosotras fuimos las que en Colombia hicimos que se hablara del tema del aborto desde otro lugar, desde el lugar de los derechos humanos, de los derechos de las mujeres, de la igualdad, de la, injust de la justicia social y pusimos los términos del debate en Colombia. Y esto generó a su vez otra estrategia fundamental, que fue la movilización social. Más y más mujeres se fueron uniendo a la causa justa y presionando al, al, a la Corte Constitucional y a este debate eh, público para que la Corte fallara a favor del derecho a decir de las mujeres. Hubo una estrategia de comunicación, hubo, entonces se generaron muchas estrategias alrededor del movimiento Causa Justa que fueron las que dieron la posibilidad de que esta conversación fuera una conversación nuestra, desde la conversación nuestra y que generara en Colombia un debate eh, que permitiera a la sociedad entender que mantener el delito de aborto en Colombia era realmente discriminatorio y violatorio de los derechos humanos. Esto realmente es un precedente histórico porque somos uno de los países, no solamente en América Latina, con un fallo y, un, y, una, y una normatividad tan avanzada, sino que podemos decir con mucho orgullo que somos un país que ha generado un fallo también histórico para el mundo, para seguir avanzando en materia de derecho a decir de las mujeres. Thank you so much, Sandra. Adriana, um, well, abortion is becoming legal in Colombia, right? It is already legal in some countries, um, as we heard from you in the beginning. Um, but that being legal and like technically legal, things sometimes could look very different in practice, right? Could you talk a little bit about, about that um, and how, how sometimes, you know, just because something is legal and uh, there's abortion legislation at place, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it is uh, easy to get. Yes, uh, definitely. And we have plenty of examples uh, across the world uh, which show that having abortion um, permitted in the law is not enough. And that what states need to do is also ensure access uh, to abortion care in practice. Um, in the countries where abortion is permitted uh, either on request or broad social grounds, we have seen um, different type of barriers uh, that uh, exist and that make access uh, uh, to this care uh, difficult or um, for some uh, people impossible. Um, some of these uh, barriers are um, uh, directly in the law. Uh, for example, there are a number of countries, including in Europe, uh, which impose mandatory waiting periods uh, before accessing abortion care. Um, some impose mandatory ultrasound requirements or bias counseling requirements. Many uh, also impose uh, third party authorization requirements. And these, these play as 
important barriers in access to abortion care for uh, many people, including adolescents, but also uh, those who are living in the areas where access, where abortion care is not available and have to travel longer distances to access to this care. Um, being subjected to mandatory waiting period is an additional burden that could lead to delaying care. Um, or for some, it could also lead to actually not being able to access abortion care if they miss out the, the time limit that is imposed uh, by the law for accessing uh, that care. Um, other barriers um, that uh, are not necessary, may not necessarily be imposed in the law, but some are, include also the cost barriers. Countries that allow abortion on request, uh, often they do not reimburse or cover abortion under their healthcare insurance schemes. And that again, for many, it's an important barrier. For example, I come from Slovakia where abortion on request, it was recently documented by um, uh, women's rights organizations there that the abortion on request uh, can cost between 250 up to, I believe, 500 uh, um, euros, depending on whether you are accessing it in public hospital or a private clinic. And this is a, a very high amount and prohibited amount, prohibitive amount for um, many people who seek abortion uh, care in, in the country. Um, so other barriers just to... Um, mention uh, mo more, some of them, uh, is um, criminalization of abortion care and having it regulated in the in the penal code, as uh, uh, Sandra was talking about, or lack of available abortion care providers. There are regions in some of the countries where um, there are no abortion providers available, or there are only few of them available, and that also Im imposes additional burdens on those who are in fact, committed to provide this essential medical care. Um, widespread uh, refusals of uh, care um, um, by medical professionals uh, on the grounds of their personal beliefs is, uh, and, uh, is also a significant barrier in many countries, including Croatia, Poland, Slovakia, Italy, for example. Um, and, uh, and, and also restrictions on who can provide abortion care is also playing as an important and uh, significant barrier in, in access uh, to, uh, to abortion. Um, so, yeah, so it's really for the states to adopt measures and to ensure that access to legal abortion is also um, possible and it's real in, in practice for, for everyone who needs this care. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much, Adriana. Um, I think it's one of the most important um, sides to the abortion discussion to think about who these legislation, like who, who this legislation really impacts the most, right? Um, Sandra, being able to get affordable, safe, and legal abortions, it's important to us ever, to us all, right? But as I said, there are some people who need it more than most of us, and where restrictive abortion legislation might affect them the harshest. Do you have any idea, or do you have any data that you could perhaps share with us um, about just who in Colombia was affected the harshest by the previous restrictions? Um, and also, was this the reason why perhaps the, the line was drawn at 24 weeks? Because 24 weeks is quite um, you know, long, longer than most legislations that I have seen. Is that one of the reasons why you tried to for perhaps you know, lower the hindrances to getting abortion? Sí, de, de hecho, uno de, de los argumentos nuestros como causa justa para pedir la eliminación del delito de aborto del Código Penal son razones de injusticia social. El 98% de las mujeres que han estado criminalizadas en Colombia por el asunto del aborto son mujeres pobres, las mujeres de zonas rurales, las mujeres jóvenes, las mujeres más excluidas, las inmigrantes. Y pues esto lo que he mostrado es que la persecución y la criminalización del aborto afecta directamente a las mujeres más excluidas económicamente de la sociedad y, y efectivamente mirando aquí la situación en Colombia nos demostró que las mujeres juzgadas por abortos eh, 
incluso aunque estuvieran en las tres causales, porque son los propios médicos los que denunciaban a las mujeres cuando llegaban con abortos inseguros, eran mujeres eh, violentadas sexualmente, mujeres eh, embarazadas como producto del, del conflicto armado, violaciones en el marco del conflicto armado y mujeres que no tienen información ni acceso a servicios de salud sexual y reproductiva a métodos anticonceptivos ni tienen información en salud sexual integral. Entonces esto lo que nos mostró y nos dio un argumento de mucho peso a nosotras en nuestra demanda es que la mayoría de las mujeres en Colombia que sufren la, el estigma, la persecución y la criminalización frente al aborto son las mujeres más pobres, las más excluidas y las que están fuera del sistema o que este sistema no les provee los servicios integrales en salud sexual y el acceso a salud sexual y reproductiva. Aquí hay un asunto de mucha injusticia social y eso fue una de las razones por las cuales la Corte consideró eliminar el delito. And one of the reasons, um, so you, you set the line at 24 weeks, was so that people had more time to travel, had more access um, to, well, had more, yeah, possibilities to, or opportunities to try and seek uh, medical care, right? Or was there any other reason behind that decision? Pues fueron, fueron cuatro razones por las cuales la Corte Constitucional eh, amplió el plazo para que las mujeres pudieran abortar por decisión hasta las 24 semanas y cabe también aclarar que las tres causales a partir de las 24 semanas se mantienen, las causales no tienen plazos, se pueden ser en cualquier momento de la gestación y las cuatro razones fueron uno, el derecho a la salud, garantizar el derecho a la salud sexual y reproductiva porque es un derecho humano, o sea, es re, el reconocimiento que ha hecho la Corte del Aborto como un derecho y, mm. eh, y eh, lo que se está generando en Colombia es una vulneración a la salud sexual y reproductiva de las mujeres restringiendo el aborto. La segunda razón por la que la Corte despenalizó el aborto fue... Eh, reconociendo la libertad de conciencia y aquí hay un elemento muy importante porque lo que reconoce la corte es que cada persona es libre en su conciencia de tomar decisiones frente a su cuerpo y frente a su vida y que nadie puede obligar a maternidades forzadas y en ese sentido la libertad de conciencia es un ejercicio individual, personal e intransferible. Es un reconocimiento, para nosotras este cargo fue muy importante porque es el reconocimiento de la libertad y de la libertad y el derecho a decir de las mujeres. El tercer cargo lo que planteó es que la penalización no puede ser la primera razón por la cual las mujeres sean criminalizadas. Lo que hay es que prevenir embarazos no deseados, eh, generar un sistema de salud y generar unas políticas de prevención integrales que eviten que las mujeres tengan que acudir a abortos inseguros o a embarazos no deseados. Entonces, poner la pena como la, la única, la, la primera razón no, no solucionaba el asunto del aborto en Colombia. Y la última y cuarta razón por la que se despenalizó es por la situación que les conté al principio, y es que las mayores víctimas de criminalización por aborto eran las mujeres pobres, las mujeres rurales, las mujeres discriminadas, las mujeres migrantes, y por eso la Corte Constitucional asumió que tener el delito de aborto en el Código Penal, así como estaba, discriminaba especialmente a las mujeres más en condición de vulnerabilidad por su situación económica y social. Entonces fueron cuatro razones que nosotras planteamos en nuestra demanda que fueron tenidas en cuenta y que son argumentos que sirven mucho para la jurisprudencia colombiana, pero también generan un precedente juris jurisprudencial incluso a nivel internacional, para seguir avanzando en otros espacios frente a la posibilidad de seguir eliminando el aborto en otros países. Thank you so much, Sandra. Um, Carolina, 
when we're talking a little bit about um, vulnerable groups, um, there is a vulnerable group at the moment. Um, uh, well, a very vulnerable group are definitely refugees. And as we know, many women um, at the moment, many women and young girls are currently fleeing from the war in Ukraine. Um, and most of them are uh, fleeing to Poland and Hungary, um, but most of them um, are fleeing from, from the war. And when they come to Poland, they are, I would say they have, um, yeah, they might get surprised if they don't know about the legislation because in Ukraine, um, there are very liberal abortion uh, laws. It's legal there in the first 12 weeks. And in Poland, as we know, it's um, almost entirely illegal. Um, have you had any experience with Ukrainians, for example, trying to seek help um, at um, abortion dream team? Um, have there been Ukrainians turning to um, your organization for help? since the beginning of the war? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, that's the first thing that I want to emphasize here is that um, I know that when we are speaking about abortion laws, um, you know, we operate uh, in this dimension, legal and illegal, and it is not that abortion is illegal in Poland. Mm. It is legal to have an abortion. It is allowed to have an abortion, but abortion will not be provided mm. to anyone, um, to almost anyone in, uh, in this shape of the law. So the only people who can try to get an abortion provided within the healthcare system mm. are people whose life or health are threatened or when they are uh, experiencing pregnancy as a result of a criminal act. So these are the only people that can you know, at least try and maybe get an abortion on this ground, which mm -hmm. in fact, in reality, probably won't happen because mm -hmm. according to the official data uh, from the hospitals, those abortions are hardly uh, provided, hardly uh, performed in Polish hospitals, but it is legal to have an abortion. You just have to know how to do it. Mm -hmm. So uh, people from Ukraine, Ukraine, mostly women who, who uh, got pregnant or got pregnant before they, they, they went away, um, they face new situation. Yes, there is no way for them to go to the hospital, to go to a doctor. It's like prescribe me, me for prison and misoprostol or perform an abortion surgically. Uh, they cannot do this. Uh, but they can have an abortion and they do have, an, have abortions when they need them. Uh, and they are in this, you know, situation that all of us are. So you just have to know who to approach. And if you approach uh, mm -hmm. abortion without borders or abortion dream team, you get information also in Ukrainian because we prepare that, uh, that you can have, you know, abortion with pills done by yourself at home on these you know that there are safe uh, sources of of uh, of abortion pills on the internet you just have to know where to go uh, how to do it uh, and we provide this information and this is for for many people no matter where they are from and uh, it, it's you know it's all they need basically if they have this information and then they can you know also ask for help uh, in terms of, you know, whether to give a donation to this organization that is helping with access or not, like, you know, to, because they are also helped if they don't have money. Uh, and, uh, and it's just, you know, yeah, and Abortion Without Borders is this helpline and it has this helpline and it is an initiative that operates in different countries. So when there's no possibility for such a person to take pills at home for different reasons, it can be. Uh, usually, you know, in within the first um, 12 to 16 weeks, people just decide that because it's easier, it's safe, it's successful, effective, and relatively cheap. But if they cannot do this, and especially, you know, when they are past 16 weeks, they have to travel abroad uh, to, uh, to uh, get an abortion abroad, just like any other person who is in Poland does. So it's, you know, it's, yes, it's, um, it's just more people that can approach us and do approach us. Uh, 
Mm. And uh, so, so, you know, it's just another, as we tend to say in abortion without borders, that's just another fact, another factor, another thing that we have to deal with in a way, you know, because there are different uh, circumstances in which we are like, you know, the fact that all of a the sudden these people were denied abortion in Polish hospitals, you know, after the judgment. And, you know, the fact that there are people coming from to Poland who might need that, you know, it's just another factor that we have to take into consideration. But there is not a single person uh, that has been denied abortion care since the start of Abortion Without Borders. It didn't stop with the pandemic and the, with the hard lockdown that we were facing in 2020. It wasn't stopped by the ruling. And, you know, and no matter how many uh, people from Ukraine need abortions, they will get support. So it, it's been like this. And, you know, I feel like there's nothing that can stop us as long as there, as there is this international solidarity that we are uh, based on in a way. And as long as there are people who want to buy other people's abortions, you know, as long as we are going to exist and we will always be needed, no matter what the law is, you know, even if there is, you know, it, you know laws always, always leave someone behind mm -hmm. for you know all these reasons that Adriana mentioned but you know there are so many mm -hmm. all sometimes there's always someone who does not fall within the scope of the law because the law abortion specific laws are not to guarantee access to abortion they are set of rules under which we can be denied abortion mm -hmm. you know so it's it's I would, I would rather say that it's never about abortion and the people who need abortion. It's about all these institutions and people who, can, who have the power to tell you, no, you are not going to get it. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, we, initiatives like this will always be needed because there will always be people who need or want to use the informal system. And, you know, so right now, informal system is everything that people in Poland have. Mm -hmm. But even if they had a chance, an option to you know to 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 go into the formal system they still would have a choice not to you know and it's mm. it's always going to be needed now everything mm. is on the shoulders of this informal uh, system but uh, but we do take care of anyone who who wants uh, to have an abortion and if you know if there is still time in any country in europe uh, we will help those people always to to get to this country and have their abortions in time so it's the only reason for which it can happen is when it's just too late to mm. travel to any country that would allow that in europe that's the only reason that somebody would be refused abortion yeah thank you so much carolina um i want to speak a little bit about religion because religion um yeah well, uh, Colombia and Poland have uh, something in common, which is um, when they both have a Catholic majority or the Catholic Catholicism is um, uh, one of the most important religions in the country. And um, Sandra, Colombia has a Catholic majority and the opinion of the church is, well, it has a very special place in, in conversation. Um, and also most Catholics do not necessarily have the reputation of being pro-choice or being the most uh, strongest uh, pro-choice campaigners. Um, how much does religion add to the stigma experienced by people who seek abortions? Bueno, sin duda, los sectores religiosos en Colombia tienen una fuerza muy importante como generadores de opinión y hacen parte del ejercicio de la política en Colombia. Tienen una injerencia indebida, pero es una injerencia muy fuerte en el Estado. Colombia, es, aquí lo entendemos en América Latina como que es un Estado laico, quizás en Europa lo entienden más como un Estado secular, eh, se supone que hay división Estado e Iglesia, pero hay una fuerte influencia de estos actores religiosos y una influencia sobre todo en una moral particular y sobre todo en la agenda contra tres temas. La agenda, contra la, eh, la agenda de la vida, la familia y la libertad. Estas tres agendas han sido la agenda política que han asumido las iglesias, no solamente la iglesia católica, porque en América Latina 
y en Colombia en particular viene tomando también mucha fuerza otras iglesias, sobre todo las iglesias cristianas, pentecostales, evangélicas, vienen tomando muchísima fuerza en esta defensa de estos tres temas que les estoy planteando, la vida, la familia y la libertad. Y con base en esto es que han hecho una agenda en contra de los derechos sexuales y los derechos reproductivos, de los derechos de las personas LGBTI y ha sido una, una campaña de odio, una campaña de violencia, de desprestigio y sobre todo de intentar a través del Estado y de la política intentar eh, retroceder lo que hemos ganado. Pues yo les he contado con mucha felicidad lo que hemos ganado en Colombia, pero me parece esta pregunta fundamental porque el papel de la religión y el papel de los grupos antiderechos y de los fundamentalismos religiosos ha sido un papel de obstruir y de obstaculizar todas las formas de lucha que hemos tenido de manera legítima el movimiento de mujeres por la libertad. Por la, por la vida y por la defensa de la familia, o sea, estos tres temas no pueden ser una agenda solo de los antiderechos, sino que pues ha sido una agenda que hemos liberado y que hemos librado el movimiento feminista durante muchos años. Entonces hoy tenemos una iglesia que está en la política, una iglesia que encontró la estrategia para obstaculizar todos estos avances a partir de de eh, tener más influencia en las decisiones del Estado a través de todas sus ramas del poder. Eh, esto no ha sido pacífico, sin duda ha sido difícil, ellos tienen una agenda muy fuerte, tienen movilización social, están en el Estado, están en el gobierno. El gobierno actual colombiano tiene una alianza con los grupos religiosos en Colombia, entonces, eh, esto ha sido una, una situación muy compleja, pero sin embargo, voces como la nuestra, que es de católicas por el derecho a decidir, ha sido también la posibilidad de mostrar desde la fe y desde el catolicismo una voz diferente y por eso una de las agendas que hemos tenido desde Causa Justa es cómo trabajar hacia la despenalización social del aborto. O sea, no basta con despenalizarlo en la ley, en la norma, sino cómo trabajamos con la sociedad y con la cultura para empezar a despenalizar las conciencias y a empezar a mostrar otros argumentos que evidencien que, pues por lo menos en el caso nuestro, las mujeres católicas que abortan no están cometiendo un pecado y que tienen la libertad de conciencia para tomar decisiones éticas y moralmente válidas frente a su vida. Thank you so much, Sandra. As I've just um, written in the chat, the Q&A session has just officially started. Um, and I we already have a question that was also in my notes. So thank you, Orleif. Uh, for posting the question. Um, it's, the, it's directed towards you, Sandra. Um, what is the next stage now for, um, for Colombia? Now the legislation has changed. Um, I mean, there's also the, the topic of implementation. Can you tell us a little bit about, um, about that? And also, um, Orleth is asking, is there a plan to start social campaigns to get the public on board? And what might, I, what might that look like? Bueno, muchas gracias por la pregunta, me parece muy importante porque ya con la sentencia de la Corte Constitucional que tiene aplicación inmediata, es decir que desde el 21 de febrero las mujeres en Colombia pueden abortar por decisión hasta las 24 semanas, lo que sigue es la implementación, o sea como causa justa estamos mirando estrategias jurídicas, políticas, para que se genere una real implementación en el sistema de salud eh, y se garantice este derecho a las mujeres. Eh, la Corte Constitucional le hizo un exhorto al Congreso de la República para que hiciera una política pública en salud sexual y reproductiva. Entonces también lo que sigue es trabajar con el nuevo Congreso que, que asumirá a partir de, agosto, de, de julio 
eh, para que se genere una política pública en este país que garantice los derechos sexuales y reproductivos. Nos toca, y, y una de las estrategias fuertes de causa justa, es mantener la conversación en la sociedad, y por eso les hablaba de la importancia de trabajar hacia la despenalización social y cultural del aborto, porque necesitamos que la sociedad entienda que es un derecho conquistado por las mujeres y que hay que empezar también a desmontar las culpas y a desmontar todos esos prejuicios religiosos, morales, culturales con los que hemos crecido históricamente los y las colombianas y que hay que empezar a, a desmitificar toda esa mala información que hay frente al aborto, a desestigmatizar el aborto. Entonces estamos en un trabajo pedagógico de despenalizar socialmente el aborto. Igualmente, para nosotras como causa justa es fundamental mantener la movilización social lo que vamos a mantener es el debate arriba, mantener, decirle a la sociedad que esto no terminó acá, o sea, despenalizamos hasta la semana 24, sin embargo, el aborto en Colombia sigue siendo delito, o sea, no lo hemos logrado lo que queremos lograr, que es eliminar por completo el delito de aborto del Código Penal. Entonces, son muchos espacios, muchos frentes de trabajo que tenemos en este momento que pasan por la formación, por la incidencia política, la, 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 el trabajo jurídico de empezar a, a pensar las estrategias legales eh, para seguir avanzando y sobre todo estrategias de comunicación. Necesitamos que los y las colombianas sepan que en Colombia el aborto es legal por decisión hasta las 24 semanas y que, y que ninguna mujer puede ser condenada eh, por, por, pues por, el, por abortar y por decidir. Es mucho el trabajo, nos toca enfrentar también, estamos eh, en, en una semana se elige nuevo presidente en Colombia, estamos en un momento electoral eh, muy fuerte donde hay dos candidatos, uno que defendería nuestro derecho a decidir y la sentencia y otro que está dispuesto a a retroceder en todo lo que hemos ganado, entonces nos estamos jugando también mucho a nivel político en Colombia, donde pensamos que pues, lo que pueda pasar frente al nuevo presidente también va a ser crucial frente al escenario democrático en el que podamos construir como causa justa un movimiento en el marco de los derechos humanos y en el marco de la democracia en Colombia. Thank you, Sandra. Um, I think all of us here wish um, Petro, Gustavo Petro and Francia Marquez all the luck um, on May 29, I believe, is the, is the election. So all the luck to, um, to them and to, of course, the Casa Justa movement. Um, Carolina, if we stay a little bit on the topic of religion, um, the reason why I brought it up was because, I mean, Colombia managed to legalize um, abortion, um, but in Poland, it's not an option for many women. Um, but both of you are Catholic countries. Um, what do you think? How, how much does religion have to do with how successful pro-choice movements can be? In fact, uh, I don't really think that it is about religion. Because when we take into consideration how many people in Poland declare that they are Catholics and uh, the statistics, the figures regarding uh, the uh, opinions about uh, abortion and what should be legal, what should be, uh, what should be accessible, what should be provided, we get the clear understanding that it is not as such connected with the you know, the, the, the person's beliefs and uh, religious, um, religious beliefs, you know, so it, it goes far beyond that. So the problem in Poland is that there is a very, very strong position of the Catholic Church as an institution. The influence that the Catholic Church hierarchs have on politicians And I'm not saying that it's been like this since the law and justice came into power, this conservative right-wing party that it has been 
uh, you know, governing our country since 2015. I'm talking about this very long history of almost 30 years of an abortion ban from 1993. There has been not a single political party, doesn't matter whether it's from the left side, from the center, from the right side, that would have been brave enough to put an end to that and to work actively towards secularization of, of the country. So it's been a common agreement, I would say, on you know all sides of the political scene that it is okay that the church, the Catholic church has so much to say. And, you know, we, I can, you know, go on, go on and on about the examples of that, but to give you one of them, that is for me, the, that actually two that are very significant. So the first is signing the Concordat, this, you know, contract with the Holy See, with Vatican, that was done when there was, you know, like the leftists were in charge. And that's how it started with religious classes in schools. That's how it started when people from my generation would have to watch Silent Scream as a part of their education in, you know, very early, you know, I, we were nine, 10, and we had to watch that propaganda movie from the US about how awful abortion is. And it's not even true uh, what is said that and showed that. So, you know, so that, what, that's one of the things. And of course, you know, the, the, the influence of the, the, the Catholic priests and, you know, nuns and how they taught religion, but not really religion and sometimes even sexuality education, you know, which is not even called like this in Poland. So that's one thing. And the, another thing I remember is that there was one attempt from the, this left party uh, that to uh, liberalize the law, you know? So like, okay, let's, let's try to, um, to just have it on demand until 12th week. They, you know, they had this, um, this draft law presented in the parliament and what came? Uh, well, the possibility to get into the European Union, it was 2003 and, you know, we had a referendum ahead of us. It was the leftist president, the leftist prime minister, the leftist government. And what did they hear from the church? You want us to tell people in churches to vote yes for the accessions to the European Union? You withdraw that law from the parliament. What did they do? They, of course, withdrew the law from the parliament. They sold abortion for European accession. You know, so, and, you know, and nobody remembers that, you know, and we've been living, in, you know, so it's, yes, the church has this big role, but because somebody let them, you know, because people, politicians in Poland, every single party is so afraid of losing votes, losing supporters, if they say enough is enough. And we pay that price because the Catholic Church played a very significant role in the transformation from the communist times into democracy at the, you know, the, the, the end of the 80s. And I say that I still have to pay price for that, but I didn't, you know, I didn't sign any contract. I didn't have any, you know, anything that any uh, deal, you know, but we still have to pay price for that because, you know, this, uh, this is when the Catholic Church realized how big influence it has and how big influence it can have, uh, you know, in, in terms of political decisions that are being made in Poland. And nobody has ever tried hard enough to put an end to that. And that's the problem. It's not about people who are Catholics because there are a lot of, you know, they're not, I, I also tend to say that there's not even enough non-Catholic people who can get pregnant to fulfill all these numbers that we have, you know, like 100,000 abortions a year, you know, it's just not enough of us non-Catholics. So it's just very clear, even mm -hmm. from the, you know, 
like mathematical point of view that Catholic women and Catholic people, you know, use contraception and, and have abortions is mm-hmm. totally okay. So it's not on this side. It's not about how religious uh, we are or not, but the fact that the Catholic church as an institution is so much involved in political decision-making in this mm-hmm. country. Thank you so much for that insight. Um, if we go back a little bit to the discussion on role versus weight that I opened up a little bit there in the in the beginning, um, Adriana, I keep reading about how the outcome of the road versus um, weight decision um, impacts or can impact the whole world. Um, how do you think overturning that decision in the U.S. will um, will impact abortion legislation around the world? I think uh, it's uh, difficult to really predict uh, what the impact of uh, the ruling um, if the if the Supreme Court uh, decides to overturn the Roe v. Wade uh, judgment. Uh, how, what would be the impact of such ruling across the world? I think that such decision would uh, certainly motivate anti-SRHR actors and anti-equality actors in their uh, efforts to further restrict reproductive rights and access to abortion care. And that would, I assume, apply across the world to those actors who also are working together or in alignment with each other on concerted efforts and strategies to uh, restrict uh, reproductive rights. In terms of the governments across the world, I I can't really uh, predict uh, what that would mean uh, for their decision making. I believe that some states would uh, not uh, be impacted by such decision and others may continue following the um, the, the trend that we have uh, seen in Colombia and other countries um, towards um, uh, reforming laws and policies to um, create enabling environment for access to abortion care. Um, so I think that really much depends on, on each of the country and the context. But uh, I think that I wouldn't be saying that such decision would only have negative impact across the world. And maybe Sandra and Carolina um, are uh, better suited to to answer that question. But just looking at Colombia, Colombia just uh, made a really historic decision to um, broaden access to abortion care, despite uh, all these efforts across the world, including in the US, because over the years we have seen Attempts, attempts to regress, or there have been decisions made in um, different federal states to restrict ac- access to abortion care. Yet we have countries like Colombia, Argentina, France, Belgium, Cyprus, Ireland, Northern Ireland, and many other countries that have uh, that have gone in different directions. So I think this will continue. Thank you so much, Adriana. It's a, it's a very nice and really refreshing perspective on this because I keep reading about how, you know, this uh, landmark decision, of course, um, will, yeah, will have such a great impact on, on a lot of legislation worldwide. But I do want to stress um, um, the point that, you know, the U.S. is one of the largest public health donors and many African countries um, depend in other countries, but also many African countries depend on, well, on the external assistance for funding um, for healthcare, including family planning and quality post-abortion care. Uh, So a lot of um, African observers um, from Kenya, for example, have also um, pointed out that, you know, what if this um, decision is going to be overturned? And what if the next Republic um, administration will then, you know, stop funding uh, from the US to those countries? There is a real threat there for sure. Um, But I also 
with that said, I also want to um, highlight um, the fact uh, that we have someone from Kenya actually who's joined our call. Um, I also want to highlight his um, his comment. Um, Alvin, uh, he shared his work um, with regards to digital activism on abortion related work in Kenya. Um, and he says that uh, quite a lot of opposition that um, they experience, um, you know, they have a lot of opposition um, within the laws and, you know, within also the social um, judgment of abortion and a lot of uh, opposition groups like Citizen Go who are hindering access of abortion um, information and services. Um, thank you, Alvin, for um, that comment. Um, I also want to, you know, uh, implore on all of you, motivate you to uh, share your own work in the chat and we can uh, perhaps then um, try to learn from each other and try to, if we do not know each other already, to strengthen the network of, um, yeah, to strengthen the feminist network. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the little space that we have left. Um, I want to talk about all the anti-choice movement and how you are all dealing with the anti-choice movement. Um, Sandra, you, quickly, you, you briefly mentioned um, your own challenges with the anti-choice movement. Um, Kausa Husta filed the lawsuit back in 2020, and you said that, you know, it took them more than 500 days um, to make that decision. And um, how did you deal with the anti-choice movement or the anti-choice groups? And how do you deal with them today? Bueno, no, todo esto ha sido un trabajo colectivo, eh, sin duda no hubiéramos podido lograr lo que hemos podido hacer con el poder de la articulación y de la capacidad de, de visionar como feministas y como organizaciones de mujeres eh, cual, en nuestro propósito colectivo. Sin embargo, como católicas por el derecho a decidir y como mujer feminista que creo profundamente en la libertad de las mujeres, el trabajo ha sido eh, constante y ha sido de toda una vida intentando desmitificar argumentos eh, de carácter religioso, claro que sí, vienen muy, muy como de esas creencias, esos imaginarios y esos prejuicios que hay contra el cuerpo y el derecho a decidir de las mujeres y que beben de una cultura judeocristiana muy fuerte que tenemos en Colombia. Y mi trabajo ha estado fundamentado en la lucha por la justicia social y sobre todo por demostrar con argumentos religiosos eh, que las mujeres tenemos derecho a decidir, que la libertad de conciencia y la conciencia es, es ese sagrario del ser humano inviolable intransferible, que nadie nos puede juzgar, ni condenar, ni imponer decisiones que vayan contra nuestra conciencia. Por eso para Católicas por el Derecho a Decidir fue un trabajo muy arduo el argumentar y que la Corte, por eso saludamos mucho que la Corte haya asumido este, esta decisión teniendo en cuenta la libertad de conciencia, que uno de los cargos y los argumentos que tuvo en cuenta la Corte fuera la libertad de conciencia, porque nuestro trabajo ha estado caminando la palabra con las mujeres y los hombres en los territorios, buscando despenalizar la conciencia, porque mientras las conciencias de la gente, de las mujeres, sigan bajo el manto de la culpa, bajo el manto del pecado, bajo el miedo a la condena moral que nos imponen las iglesias, va a ser muy difícil que existan leyes y que la gente las asuma desde adentro y desde la conciencia. Entonces mi trabajo, más bien el trabajo colectivo de católicas por el derecho a decidir, ha estado enfocado en la despenalización de las conciencias, en liberar a las mujeres, en quitar las culpas y en hablar con la jerarquía de la iglesia católica y demostrarle que esos argumentos son incoherentes, que no responden a la realidad ni al devenir de los tiempos y que no va a prosperar una iglesia 
donde la mayoría somos las mujeres y que finalmente nos está condenando al destierro, a la muerte y nos está condenando a que nuestras decisiones no sean respetadas. Entonces nuestro discurso, nuestra narrativa y nuestro camino ha sido el de la libertad y ha sido el de enfrentar a, a la jerarquía de la Iglesia Católica desde los argumentos católicos, pero a favor de la libertad y el derecho a decidir de las mujeres. Y eso es lo que seguiremos haciendo, despenalizando las conciencias y despenalizando socialmente el aborto. Thank you so much, Sandra. I have a, I have a question from Renata, um, and I think it's a really, really good um, question for all of you uh, at the end of our panel, which is, um, I'm going to read it out loud. My question is for all speakers, and it is about narratives. Have we seen the narrative change when it comes to abortion? Um, Carolina just talked about the role of the church and its impact on the narrative. What would it mean to take over the narrative? Perhaps, Carolina, would you like to start? Yes, actually, it's. Uh, I, I read that question and I was uh, waiting for it, actually. And uh, also... Uh, what you said about um, anti-abortion movements, uh, I think that I can, in a way, combine uh, the two because I think that the strength is in the stigmatization and normalization of abortion. Mm -hmm. Abortion is not, you know, just a, um, you know, a concept. It's not a some, you know, something to talk about and decide, you know, um, uh, about in a, you know, like theoretical way. It's a fact. It is a normal part of our sexuality, you know, and it's older than any law, than medicine, than anything. It just came with, you know, the fact that we can get pregnant and it will stay with us forever as long as we get pregnant. <laughs> and You know, if we treat it like this, it's just a normal part of our sexual lives. We have abortions, we don't have abortions, we think about them, we think what we would do if we get pregnant, got pregnant and we wouldn't want to be, you know, and we think about what, it's, it's just a part of our lives and it's okay to have an abortion, it's okay not to have an abortion. Whereas people who are anti-abortion, anti-derechos, you name them, have one goal which we don't have as pro-choice movement because we have many many goals and i think that the success behind anti-choice anti-abortion anti-derechos people is that they have one goal to make everyone believe that abortion is something bad and if we get together you know all the pro-choice movement and have that one goal to make everyone believe that abortion is okay, we can win that. But, you know, we have to take away our own stigmas within ourselves because we have self-stigma. And it's normal, it's, you know, it's inevitable because that's what abortion laws did to us. You know, beyond 12 weeks, you know, you can, you have to have a good, you know, reason good enough. This is too late. That is too early. That is not a reason good enough. You're too young, too old. You know, it's your, you know, you don't, you didn't use contraceptions. You, you, you know, all this. We do put boundaries on ourselves. And when we are free of that, when we are free of stigma and we normalize abortion as something that just happens to us, that one in three of us, will or or has had in our lifetime and we, when we treat it like this we will succeed and we get rid of of everything but uh so i think this is what we should do like to reframe abortion in this method that abortion is not always a hard decision you know traumatic difficult and you know because it is sometimes but it is just a decision and an experience that some of us have and some of us don't and if we treat it It's a normal decision that we make every day about our lives, about our health, that it's nothing wrong with that, then we can move forward. I believe, I truly believe that the stigmatization and normalization of abortion is the way to go. Adriana. 
Just to follow on that, and um, as part of this uh, changing the narrative, focusing also on the work around that has been done by many uh, feminists and activists on uh, decriminalization, Sandra spoke about it a lot, and and Carolina as well, and the, the fact that these laws, abortion laws, are based on the very idea of that abortion uh, is something bad, it should be criminalized. In many countries, abortion is regulated in the penal code, including in, in Germany. And, uh, and that in and of itself uh, contributes uh, to stigma uh, about abortion care and creates chilling effects on the provision of abortion care, even in the context where uh, those who need abortion care are not criminalized, like for example, in Poland, but uh, then you have providers, for example, who are uh, criminalized. And the narratives related to that, um, I liked uh, uh, what Sandra was uh, speaking about, uh, freedom of conscience, and that is kind of shifting towards those who are deciding about their pregnancies, um, that they are making conscious decisions or, or that's a freedom of conscience to decide or part of that to decide. Uh, while up to now we have seen conscious being used mostly with regard to medical providers who are refusing to provide abortion care for their personal beliefs. And, and so moving away from the so-called consciousness objection in the uh, reproductive health care context towards really naming it what is happening there, and that is that essential health care is being denied to those who need it by those who, for personal uh, reasons, believe that they should not be providing it and continue to also in, in, in that work and, and shifting the narratives in, with regard uh, to issues that are related uh, to, to abortion. Sandra, you have the last word um, since we're already a little bit over time, uh, <laughs> but we would still love to hear your thoughts. Me siento muy eh, recogida en lo que ha planteado Carolina y Adriana en esa narrativa. Siento que ese es el camino. Solo eh, sumaría que esta narrativa tiene que ver por poner en el centro del debate el derecho a decidir y la autonomía. O sea, siento que hay que dejar el miedo. Sé, sé que hay mucho estigma contra las feministas en el mundo. Sé que nos ha tocado asumir un costo muy grande por defender lo que defendemos, pero no podemos renunciar a que, pone, a que pongamos en el centro del debate nuestro derecho a decidir y nuestra autonomía. Esto no podemos renunciar a, es, a, a este derecho. Creo también que ha funcionado y para el caso colombiano lo, lo usamos mucho en estas nuevas narrativas, es demostrar que mantener el delito de aborto discrimina a las mujeres, ¿sí? porque es un delito que va contra una parte de la sociedad y de la población, es un delito que va especialmente contra las mujeres y las personas con capacidad de gestar. Y, y, y en ese sentido es discriminatorio y es ineficaz. A nosotras nos funcionó bastante como narrativa mostrar y evidenciar cómo tener penalizado el aborto eh, no, no hace que las mujeres dejen de abortar. Las mujeres seguirán abortando así esté penalizado. El asunto es que se mueren, se enferman, se enfrentan a abortos inseguros. Entonces creo que situar la conversación en el ámbito de la discriminación, de la, ineficaz, de la ineficacia del delito es muy importante. Pero también hay una, un asunto que, que creo que también hay que situarlo y es que donde hemos logrado avanzar frente al asunto del aborto nos ha demostrado que el aborto no es una obligación. Sí, que precisamente así como deseamos que la maternidad sea deseada, eh, lo que nos ha mostrado los logros que hemos tenido es que el aborto es también voluntario, no es una imposición. Entonces, si las personas por sus creencias y por, y por toda la carga cultural que tienen no desean hacerlo, nadie les va a obligar a que lo hagan, pero no pueden obligar a otras a que no a que no deciden y tomen decisiones con libertad. 
Entonces, eh, pues lo que para nosotras es muy importante es que en el centro de las decisiones estamos las mujeres y retomo esto último que dijo Adriana, es que la clave está en la conciencia, en la conciencia moral y en la agencia moral que tenemos las mujeres para tomar decisiones libres y para tomar decisiones responsables sobre nuestras vidas y sobre nuestros cuerpos. Entonces el aborto es un asunto de responsabilidad y es un asunto de un proyecto de vida que no se puede imponer. Entonces la maternidad es una opción y no es una imposición y nadie nos puede imponer maternidades forzadas. Queremos que todos los hijos e hijas que vengan al mundo sean producto del amor, del deseo, de la planeación y no queremos más hijos e hijas no deseadas en una sociedad que ya está hasta aquí de la violencia y, y del desamor. Entonces queremos una política del amor, queremos una política del deseo y queremos un ejercicio de libertad donde las mujeres podamos decidir a conciencia sobre nuestro proyecto de vida. Creo que esa es como la narrativa, es una narrativa de amor, es una narrativa de afecto y es una narrativa que nos acerque a maternidades deseadas y maternidades seguras, no maternidades impuestas. Thank you so much, Sandra. And I'm so, I love that the fact that the word love was dropped within this discussion and love what that we all seek in, in, in terms of discuss, discussing these uh, rights. Thank you so much to all panelists. I thought this was a really, really insightful conversation. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you uh, to the audience who also posted their comments. Um, I want to quickly just um present to you the next panel that we're going to speak um that we're going to uh, organize on june um uh, i'm sorry it was june 6 i believe <laughs> uh maybe someone in the chat can correct me here um but oh sorry it's june 7 um june 7 it's going to be on reframing birth um we also want to stress the fact that from the perspective of reproductive justice, um, abortion is not the only topic of um, reproductive self-determination, um, but uh, we wanna see it as one issue amongst um, other issues. And it's also connected to other um, topics that come up in our reproductive lives, like birth, like contraception, like parenting, and like also uh, reproductive uh, technologies. So, Next, um, next time, we've also put the link in the chat to our next panel uh, discussion uh, on reframing birth. But for today, for now, thank you again to the panelists and um, have a great day, everybody. See you next time. <laughs>